And then if we look maybe earlier down. Oh shit, You just have to be extra careful. We're very much closely related to sea squirts and landslids. This is finally the last chapter of invertebrate zoology. We're going to be talking about hemichordates and some of the lower chordates. When discussing chordates, these are the five main characteristics with some sources only really referring to the first four. Medyo mas tanggap naman na ngayon na talagang may endocytes. So sa amin na natin, I have explained these features in more detail in some of the ancient videos that I've made. So I'm going to just leave the links to those somewhere here so that you can watch them. Why am I making another video about these guys? Well, because I realized there were a few things that I actually missed. First is the name Cordate. Cord means string, and this refers to two of those structures, the dorsal hall and nerve cord in the middle, which kind of look like strings running down the length of the body of your cordate. What about hemi cordata? Hemi means half. The distinguishing features that they have that they do share with chordates is that they have pharyngeal gill slits, and some species also have the dorsal hollow nerve cord. You could say hemi refers to either having one of the two cords, or it could refer to it having half of the features of chordates. Whichever way you put it, that's kind of how they named it. Half a chordate. I don't know which of the two you could choose from, but yun yung mga possible na dahil. While hemichordates do share two of the five characteristics of chordates, they also have some certain features that are unique to their group. For example, they have what we call a somacord. Plus, the general body plan of your hemichordate would consist of a proboscis, a collar, and a trunk. The two main classes of hemichordates would include the solitary enterognusta, which would be commonly called your acorn worms, and then you also have the colonial graptolithoidea. Formerly, these were known as the group pterobranchia. And it's fairly, fairly easy to distinguish between these two classes based on morphology alone. But if we were to indulge on the anatomy, let's say, like for example, why are acorn worms called acorn worms? Yeah, I know, you could have thought of something else. But please, let's get our heads out of the gutter. And while they are commonly called acorn worms, scientifically, they're called enteropneusta, which translates to gut breathing. But remember that they have pharyngeal gill slits. These are lined with cilia, kind of like fine hairs that facilitate the water flow from the mouth out towards the gill slits. Part of their gut is involved in respiration. For pterobranchs, little is known about their group in general. They're like very rarely encountered by zoologists. So what more for people like us? But if for the sake of mental exercise, we were to compare these two main classes, try to kind of think about what acorn worms eat. So much dirt in my stomach. <laughs> How do they live? How do they possibly reproduce? How are they adapted to their respective environments? There's poop tubes. How about for terabrains? This is now a time for us to apply everything we've learned about relating form and function, which we've done in so many previous episodes. Hopefully, everything that you've learned from then, you can now sort of figure out how it pans out for these groups. Let's move on to chordates. There are three main subphyla for phylum chordata. Cephalochordata contains your lancelets, tunicata containing your teeth, vertebrae, which contains all the other animals with vertebrates or backbones. Kasama po tayo doon. Since we're all under one phylum, you know what that means. We are family. And it's all because we also share these five main characteristics with cephalochordates and tunicates. If we were to move closer to the roots of the tree of life, you're also going to see that we're very much closely related to hemichordates, also echinoderms. Hashtag team assholes. Deuterostomes. Your main representative for cephalochordata would be branchiostoma, and then for tunicata, that would be polycarpa, which was formerly known as pandosia. Go ahead, check out the ancient videos I made. They're all described there, the anatomy and all of the stuff going on inside their body, so we're not going to focus on that. Instead, we're now going to look more into the diversity of the things that you might find in the field, particularly for tunicates. Tunicates, as the name suggests, have this kind of outer bag called the tunic, is made of something that's pretty similar to cellulose. Two common groups of tunicates that you might see in your next vein, K in the ocean, would be the Ascidiaceans and the Phalaeaceans. Ascidiaceans, you typically find them on the substrate, just stuck there. So the adult forms are sessile. I'm gonna stay here for the rest of my life. That's kind of their thing. The Phalaeaceans, on the other hand, they're more planktonic. They're found more in open waters. Some of them can actually move around by jet propulsion, so there's that bit of a thing going on. <laughs> You'll also notice that many of them are actually transparent. Why? If you were like a brightly colored thing, right smack in the middle of the blue, everybody's gonna see you. And they're gonna be like, hmm, what's that? You're attracting unsolicited attention. If you're fairly unfamiliar with marine diversity, right off the bat, you wouldn't know what these guys are. For 
example, the robust obsidian, it's got that whole perforated look in its tunic. The incurrent and the excurrent siphons kind of look like oscula, so you could easily mistake them for sponges. What about the salpa? Salpas talaga yung plural niya. Maski ako nagulat, as in, I thought I was just like sea salps. But then it was like, salpas. There are certain times of the year where oceans would have like a congregation of salpas. So anong tawag doon? Salpukan. And if it is that time of the year where a lot of things just get carried by strong currents, you just have to be extra careful because it's not just salpas that are floating in that soup of strong current. Nidarians, tenophores, and they kind of look fairly similar to your salpas. Kwa minsan talaga pagka hindi mo sila kilala, magugulat ka when you see them in the water. It's like, oh my god, jelly, 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 and then they panic in the water or whatever. It's during these times when the visibility in the water is also not that clear. Since there's just so much particulate matter floating in the ocean, it's like a whole soup party of transparent, floating things that you don't really know. At least, now, you know. They are not sponges, and they are not telephones, they are not nidarians. They're their own thing. Tunicates. Oh my gosh, we're finally done. This would be the summary of all the major groups of invertebrates that we have encountered throughout the semester, along with their diagnostic or defining characteristics. While there are many features that do make each of these groups unique, we are all animals. And what are animals were basically glorified tubes. Tubes with these extensions that sort of function to bring food into that tube. Tube being the gastrointestinal tract, which could be incomplete in some species like, for example, Nidarians. Nature teaches us that given enough time, a humble tube can diversify and look all sorts of crazy different, but in essence, we're all doing the same thing. Many paths can lead to the same or similar outcome. So there's really no right or wrong way to do things in nature. There's just different ways. I am the one, the way your son don't need so instead of maybe trying to force everybody to adhere to the same beliefs and same everything, why not celebrate diversity? I mean, imagine if the entire planet was just filled with sea stars. Ah! There's not much going on. We're all sea stars. And all because we just think that being a sea star is the best way to be. Nature thrives in diversity. And maybe it's about time we embrace that too. Hey, hey, wow. We're done. We're done. And yet, we're done. We're done. So, dahil tapos na tayo, pero nabitin pa kayo, go ahead, check out these videos, check out these sources. Hindi lang naman ako ang pwedeng panggalingan ng kaalaman. The world has so much to offer. The whole World Wide Web is a nice place to learn a lot of things about the world around you. If you have access to nature, go ahead, dive into the ocean, go into the caves, explore nature. I think that's one of the best ways to learn about the life around you. I hope you enjoyed the semester with me as much as I did creating these videos for you guys. Kahit na alam kong medyo parang uh, <laughs> sabaw. Pero maraming salamat po talaga at naging bahagi po kayo ng Bio 116. Toodles!